our next presenters uh, come to us from the ZVB. As I mentioned yesterday, um, there, there was a trend for a while for people to just start up group con lanes. And usually we just rush right in, you know, with a lot of interest and vigor. And we were, uh, we were all excited to do it for about two days. And then on day three, suddenly nobody came back. And then pretty soon after a couple of weeks, the language was completely dead. Uh, today, um, uh, Tam Blackster and Jan Strauss are, are going to tell us about a collaborative con lane that's been going for or about six years and is still going strong. So, um, it's Akana, and here they are. Well, hello. Um, this is not really about um, a collaborative con land, but about a collaborative con world, actually. Um, but it's most, it's very much based on uh, con landing and also in kind of a collaborative sense. So, um, well, we can just describe what it is. Now, I think uh, you could call Akana a collaborative convert, um, which includes most aspects about, uh, of, of converting. But um, the special thing about it is not only that uh, it has existed for so long and that uh, new material is still being added to it, but also that uh, it developed in um, a probably quite unusual way. And uh, we would like to describe how um, we proceeded in creating this world, and uh, maybe um, we can we can see some reasons or some some factors that helped uh, keep it alive for so long. Okay, well, um, the world grew out of uh, a game that was proposed on the ZBB even before I joined it. Uh, so it was um, in two thousand five, um, a collaborative reconstruction game. Um, the idea was um, two teams were made. Um, each team had to create one uh, proto-language, which uh, should be kept secret. It was just um, a basic sketch, probably. I don't know how long it took, but probably something like one or two weeks to create this language. Um, then each team uh, was to derive daughter languages from this uh, proto-language uh, using regular sound changes, creating, changing some stuff in the grammar, um, and translating one sample text um, and these uh, daughter languages were then to be published, and the other team should re to reconstruct uh, the proto language from the information of these daughters only, which was um, quite an interesting game, and there were a lot of people involved. And um, well, uh, these are the two proto languages that were used, just um, a short, to give you a short impression of what these languages look like. Um, if you want to read about this. In more detail, you can uh, always have a look at the Akana wiki, and we also have uh, some more information on these slides that then we actually focus on right now. Um, these are both, um, both relatively isolating languages, and uh, especially in Dakta, which became the uh, most important language of this um, convert, uh, in, in a sense, because most of the other existing languages are derived from it. Um, this uh, language is actually in uh, grammar quite similar to uh, some Indo-European languages. Um, so it was quite easy to do something with it. And um, we can just see um, Ndakta was uh, created as the proto-language for, um, um, for this game. So it had a specific purpose. It was um, created a priori, uh, unlike most of the other languages in, uh, in this con world. And um, well, uh, it was more or less a sketch with a lot of words. Um, but not a very detailed grammar. But then we, uh, you can see there are some interesting features. Uh, we'll just um, show them for a few seconds. You can read them later when you want to see them online um, because we have, don't have the time now. These five languages uh, were derived from um, Ndakta in the first game uh, Adata and Dokaiso, Naida, uh, Naida actually. Faralo and Erdik. Um, these languages um, were a little bit, um, well, they, they were quite interesting in, in some ways. Some of these, uh, um, some of the people did similar changes. And so um, uh, some, in some places it looked like um, a real language family. In other places it didn't look like a real fa language family at all. Um, for example, 
uh, Doc Eisen has a quite weird phonology and quite weird sound changes. Dick is even worse. So um, these uh, were some things that later we found out, okay, we have to cope with it in some way. Um, here you just see uh, some cognates for these languages. Um, and um, one thing that is um, interesting in a convoling sense, and it's also a problem that we encountered later, uh, is that if you look at the word for eight in Adata and Faro, it looks quite similar. They, they underwent very similar sound changes, but uh, geographically, these languages are on opposite ends of uh, the of the family. Um, this game was um, supplemented with some historical background, which was not really part of the game originally, but uh, then um, people just started doing stuff like that. Um, the first team created the Iowa Valley setup, which included a few maps um, and included some sketches uh, about the cultures and uh, also about some other peoples in the region, which uh, was quite important later on. Um, the second team created an Eastern Isles setting um, with short but cliche culture descriptions. And um, uh, then there was some discussion and eventually it was decided that these two um, settings should be on the same planet and some of the languages even borrowed words from each other. Um, the result is uh, we had some languages and two families, uh, but the reconstruction of the proto-languages did not get very far. Only one participant, uh, Mark Rosenfelder, ever published any results, and he did this only, I think, four years later. If you want to see this reconstruction, that's the address. That's the uh, original map of the planet. Um, which uh, gives a good overview about the setting. Um, one problem that we ran into later is that uh, the word is not really plausible in, in terms of plate tectonics, but uh, at that moment, nobody cared. <laughs> That's uh, the initial map of the I-1, which is the focus, the focus region. Um, about a year later, a second game uh, was started, um, which was a derivation relay. The goal was to uh, explore linguistic change over great time gaps. So um, the idea was uh, we take one language, um, some person derives a daughter from it, uh, create, translates a short sample text, and then the next person, person starts with that language and does the same. Basically the same uh, principle as in, um, as in the translation relay, but uh, here it, it was um, diachronic linguistic change. And um, it was really, quick and dirty approach, um, because every participant had only two weeks. So you get sketches, and it was um, well, quite um, uh, quite a lot of work to do in these two weeks. You had to come up with sound changes, uh, provide a description uh, of morphology and syntax, just uh, so the next participant knew what, uh, what the language worked like. And you had to translate the sample text, which uh, in this case was um, the same as in the first game in Team A. Um, originally, it was not a plan for this uh, for this game to start with the same language, um, but then just uh, Daniel Jones offered his Adata language from the first game uh, as a starting point for this one. So that's um, basically just chance uh, how these were connected. But then um, here you see a, a short um, impression of this Adata language. Um, this, uh, in, in contrast to the, uh, to the first uh, proto-language in Daktat, this already had an existing setting, um, which uh, also influenced how the game went on. Um, some um, information about the background, about the setting, this is mostly to read at home, <laughs> or later on, maybe. And this is the resulting family tree uh, that um, we had after this game ended. You see it's uh, quite a long chain, I think seven generations in, in the longest branch. Um, and this, um, actually some of the sound changes are so radical that these seven generations uh, would realistically be something like 10,000 years or so. So um, really long time that to see uh, in the first generation there were some more languages uh, this was um, because people started um, well 
uh, adding more languages there when the game turned out to take a long time. And they were just waiting for their turn somewhere in uh, round six or seven. And then uh, they just switched and started from one of the earlier languages. Another table of cognates. Um, here you can see some uh, um, quite strange developments. If you look at the word for king in, uh, one, of, in one of the later rows, there's um, a few changes that uh, <laughs> if you just see the word, to, you just uh, can't really imagine how they got to that stage. But these uh, are quite regular and uh, well, in some way strange. One of the reasons for this, of course, is um, that uh, everyone tried to do something completely different than the person before them. These are um, the, the other ones are just um, branches in. in uh, okay. okay. Um, after this game became slower and uh, people tended to take much longer for their turns, um, others, as I've said, started broadening the family and uh, adding some additional detail about uh, the world. Um, and because of this and because uh, of uh, all this context that was already there and some hints that you could uh, start uh, start from to uh, develop more stuff. Uh, well, this started to become a full-scale homeworking project at this point. Some of the things that um, we have done in this uh, during this time, and uh, which we are continuing now, is just adding some more detail in a historical setting. Um, <coughs> we uh, created an IRC channel. We, created a forum, we created a wiki to collect all the information. Um, we made some maps, you see one in the background which is newer, it's still not definitive because uh, there's st uh, still not the version that everyone agreed on how the world should be set out, but uh, it's one that we can use at the moment, maybe we can have a better map some, sometime later. But um, it was good that we had an initial map uh, of lower quality, but which we could use to know everything and so we didn't know, um, we didn't have to create the perfect world map first before doing anything else. Um, new languages were created, um, some of them within the Adastayan family, um, mostly in different branches, um, and also some completely new language families were introduced, um, which were typologically different from, uh, from these. Also, a lot of a lot of other um, projects, part, part projects were proposed, but uh, as it always goes, um, some of these ideas uh, have been around for four or five years and uh, are still not much more developed than just uh, one mention and one idea how uh, they should work out. Um, here are some examples for um, the other proto languages that we use. Um, yeah, go through them. Um, then uh, one of the projects that we started um, was uh, reconstruction, but not reconstruction as in the original reconstruction game. Um, instead, in some of the cultural descriptions uh, of the first relay, the first game, there were um, mentions of surrounding peoples, and uh, there were also mention which of these peoples were supposed to be related to each other. And some of the later languages uh, had long words from these languages. So. Um, we had a few words to start from, um, but these words were not uh, supposed to be related when they were created, except uh, for this um, mention of um, the connection in, in the original culture description. And then um, we started uh, to um, look for these long words, identify where they could come from, and identify um, what kind, of, what their proto-language would have looked like language that was never created before. And, um, this worked surprisingly well. Here you see some uh, uh, of these cognate sets um, that, uh, where we had the words in the left three columns, and then we uh, decided to reconstruct them in such a way as on the right hand. But um, this um, project still doesn't have a real grammar, but uh, we have quite a good idea of what the sound correspondences would be. Um, well, and then some people began to revise their own languages, mostly uh, to uh, add some more realism or to reflect um, growing skill in the <coughs> language after a few years. 
and also of uh, changing goals, what, what we wanted the world and the languages to be like, and to adapt to the historical context, make it more believable, um, for example, by uh, sharing some innovations um, with neighboring languages. Um, some of these um, revisions presented a problem. Uh, some of the geographically important languages were lacking in grammar, um, and their creator, creators uh, did not participate any longer. Um, one of the examples is uh, Doc Iso. This is um, the revised version because we don't have any texts in the original. Um, with this, uh, at some point, we decided to re engineer the language with uh, a bit more believable sound changes um, and start completely um, afresh. But uh, the goal was to keep the most important place names intact and the phonology intact um, uh, to capture the original flair of the language. Um, this was actually the only attempt to, um, to create a really collaborative language because um, uh, I did most of the um, verbal morphology, morphology and of the syntax, and someone else did most of the work um, on sound changes and uh, dominant morphology. Well, at this point, um, we encountered one problem, uh, which is many people were interested in this project because it was quite visible on the board, and uh, we had lots of languages and lots of material and several people where they thought this uh, is an interesting thing, I want to join, and said they wanted to join and read some stuff, and then uh, they felt, well, there's so much material going on there, you have to know everything before you can uh, find a place where to enter it. And so um, we uh, asked ourselves the question, what should we do in order to attract new participants and uh, make them stay with us, most importantly? Uh, so from this point, we decided to go back to what worked before. And um, so we started a new derivation relay. That's like the, um, the second game we described, uh, where uh, each participant derives a language sketch from the participant before. Um, and we wanted to try and avoid some of the, uh, the less realistic features of the first relay. So um, the first relay created as we said, extreme time depth, and, uh, but actually not very much detail along the way. So what we wanted to, hit, to have here was much broader language family, and we wanted to start with a proto-language that was that much more detailed than the data or that kind of thing, so that we didn't have the problem of coming back later and saying, all right, well, now we need to flesh this out, but there's lots of people who rely on it. So we started with two different proto-languages, um, both of which were a yeah, both of which were, uh, which were Proto Western and Proto Peninsula. And as you can see, they were that much less Indo European like than mm -hmm. um, the Nagata and Bakar and the other languages we first worked on were, which then presented quite a challenge to people. Um, I'll probably just quick go through this. And again, there, as you can see, that was the result of the, the, um, the second relay. And it did indeed create a much broader language family. And in some sense, it much more realistic than the first game created. Um, these, you, know, you can make a table of cognates, and unlike some of Adata's daughters, you can actually see that all these words are related, quite obviously. Um, so I guess it was less, less time back than the previous one. And because it wasn't a reconstruction relay like the first one, no one was trying to obfuscate, no one was trying to make their language um, difficult to reconstruct from. Um, okay, so um, we thought we would talk a bit about, uh, go back over that, what things, what conclusions can we draw that other people can maybe use to make their Collaborative projects work well as well. So, what was right? So, um, we think it actually was very helpful that the, we started with something which wasn't billed as a collaborative project. Um, the people who had got involved at the beginning were interested in con, uh, comics, they were interested in creating languages and joining material. 
um, which meant that they were quite happy to um, well, get involved and contribute something straight away rather than arguing about it a lot. Um, everyone could work on their own, on their own little section, and there was no, it didn't have any problem. Um, and nobody had to commit immediately to long term involvement because, as far as everyone was concerned at that point, it was just uh, a one off game. And also, this helped because we were only asking about with the sketch lines, so again, didn't create an awful lot of um, commitment from people to start with. Um, and it didn't create people to, well, it didn't require people to be, it took a lot of work into research either. But people did need to create languages which were presented in a style so that the next person could then pick up the relay. So from the beginning, uh, there was effectively a, a, a method of stopping people putting joke content in or not taking the project seriously or I don't know that because if they did, they would mess up the next person's turn. Um, incidentally, people also just added little bits and pieces of cultural background as they went along which, although it wasn't um, intended, turned out to be extremely useful. Um, it's also helped the project to think that there have been several different points where new people could enter. Um, as we've mentioned, there have been the three different games, and we've had new participants enter the project in every one of those. Um, and as I just mentioned, the material that made the games made part of reference to lots of the bits and pieces that actually hadn't been fleshed out and then those then were entry points for other people. So somebody would say, oh and incidentally this language I'm writing about borrowed from its neighboring culture which is called this and that word is all we had that cultural name. Um, and then somebody else could come along and work on that on their own. And so it also allowed people to move around within the project without stepping on people's toes. Uh, another thing that's helped is um, the Edistane family that we mentioned earlier, which was the result of the, well, the half of the first relay and the second relay. Um, were, again, particularly in Dartmouth and the Diabet family, a shared ground for most of the contributors, because most of the contributors were part of one or both of those relays, those, those games. And so there is a bit of, despite the fact that everybody's working on their own stuff, there is a bit of content that everybody has been familiar with. Um, it's also the biggest online family that any of us have ever actually come across, which is, adds a certain prestige. Everyone's quite proud of that fact in the project. And that um, has, I think that's helped maintain enthusiasm. It makes people feel this is a project that has already done worthwhile things and is worth keeping on working on. But things also went wrong, and they're also uh, Left with the learn from that. So um, the relays may have been a great way of getting people involved, but they also created material that was quite hard to work with later on. Um, because we didn't because for the very reason we didn't call it a collaborative project to start with, some people just didn't actually save their material, or um, at least it was never said it was never saved in a collective storage space, so a lot of it's been lost later on. Um, we were also, we started out with very different aims. Um, there was less focus on realism, less focus on naturalism at that point. And so what people were trying to do was make things that were interesting and different to the people before them, and things that were in the first game made for reconstruction harder for the other team, which uh, is not how actual language diachronics works. <laughs> Um, Let's speak differently from our parents just so that people can't. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, Also, as a result, some of the languages we then end up with very unnaturalistic languages, but then whole language families have uh, 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 then been derived from them, so we can't go back and change them without creating huge amounts of work for ourselves. So that, that's been a problem. Um, also, in another sense, the second relay wasn't that successful because because of all the requirements we put in it, because we said people have to take it very seriously and create large grammars from these very un Indo European languages. And that was very off putting for people and resulted in people taking much, much longer over their terms than had been planned. And so after a while, everybody got dropped out and we ended up with a much smaller language family than we intended. 
but still, uh, um, of course, uh, still it had uh, the effect that um, the languages created there were more realistic. So these goals worked out in one way and didn't work out in another one. Um, and during the last year, uh, the project has perhaps succumbed to the same problems that other kinds of projects tend to succumb to, which is it's slowed down because we are all being so polite and democratic about how we make decisions. Um, people have very little new material, well, it's not entirely true, but less new material has been created in the last year than previously because um, as the project gets bigger, people have expressed opinions on more and more things, everyone's contributed more and more. So there's less and less uh, non-shared space. There's less stuff that you can just start working on and it's yours. Um, <coughs> so we've, we've, we've said recently that uh, we need to change the way that works and that's something we're still working on. So yeah, Brendan, just a summary of lessons to be learned from this. Uh, so yeah, from that last one, <laughs> if you're gonna start a project, don't have democracy, don't be polite, just go on with it. And we've watched other people's collaborative Commonwealth projects where, or common line projects where they have to vote on every item that goes in, and they don't get anywhere because it takes so long to make anything. Another useful thing is that because we didn't start out intending to create the Commonwealth, we have worked from the bottom up. We started with some languages, and then we made a little bit of culture around those, and then we made some other languages, and made a little bit of culture around those, and we've worked, let's say, from the bottom up. If we worked from the top down, I suspect we wouldn't have lasted more than a month because one of the biggest problems we've had is doing realistic maps and maps that everyone can agree on. And if we worked from the top down, that's what we'd have started with. So also working from the bottom up allows people to work on whatever particular things they enjoy working on. Um, and then another thing, so this is something that we, in some sense, have done well, in some sense, have haven't, is thinking about what kind of approach you want, what kind of um, style of material you want right from the beginning. Um, if we had found some way to be clearer about, well, we didn't know then, but if we know we wanted naturalistic language from the beginning, the whole thing would have been rather easier. Um, and that's been somewhat helped, and as I said, the last point, start with this guy's knowledge test. Well, the relay games and the reconstruction games, to take part in those, you had to know how to write a grammar in a relatively academic style. You had to write, because you had to be able to write and set the next person could use it. And you had to know how diachronics work. Is the Commonwealth still open to new participation? Definitely. <laughs> That's one of the reasons uh, why we decided to make this to make this presentation and uh, to link all the, the current addresses. Well, um, actually, more to that, can you maybe explain, let's say if somebody was watching and they might be um, interested in kind of jumping in, what would be the next step? Um, well, um, the first step would, of course, be uh, contacting us. Um, yeah, so, um, Yes, contacting us is good, and then there is, um, on the wiki there is a page they call the to-do list to which anybody who's in the, in the project can add, um, and there's lots of items on that to-do list which are things like whole language families, which nobody has claimed. So we'd be very happy if people wanted to come and claim anything from that list, or just read around on the wiki or on any other material we've made, and if you see something that's mentioned and not fleshed out, the likelihood is we'd be very happy to jump in and uh, have a go. Uh, I know probably other people have questions, but I'm still curious. So, um, what's your main means of communication? Is it uh, is it the Akana Wiki? Do you guys use the ZBB? Do you use a separate mailing list? Or you? Uh, well, we've got the Wiki uh, talk pages on that for sort of topic specific issues. Um, there's a thread on the ZBB which um, is very long, but mostly discussions been moved. Well, a lot of discussion have been moved from that onto a separate forum um, over the last year or two. Um, when there's a link to that in the slides, which we'll be at, and that's where, if you want to come along and um, ask where to start, then that would be a good place to go. Cool. Um, can I ask that somebody? Yes, earlier you were talking about uh, the accidental reconstruction of a proto language. And I was wondering, um, 
if you if you start with two unrelated languages and try to compare words, uh, it uh, you won't get a good result. That's that's the reason why the comparative method works. So I'm wondering how did those um, words that were used for the programming language end up in the um, language families in the first place? Um, well, these words um, uh, that these words were used in. Uh, they started in, in, uh, as loan words in languages that belong to the Adestayan languages. So um, uh, originally these were just meant to um, create some difference and some naturalism for uh, the main part of the project. Um, and then because we had these um, um, uh, descriptions that just started out and described uh, the cultures that uh, um, were living in the, uh, nearby regions, and um, we knew from these descriptions that the languages should be related. And at some point, uh, we decided, well, um, let's have a look if it's possible to reconstruct anything about uh, the common ancestor of these languages. And then we were just looking through the lexicons uh, to um, find out if there are a few words that might be cognate. <coughs> so we just started actually from, from just um, more or less like a real, a real world a linguist would um, see two languages that um, were said to be related by um, people living nearby, uh, and then just um, try to figure out um, where exactly the connection is. And of course, that's, that's pretty the description of very bad real linguistics in that <laughs> you take any two languages and you can find a load of things that you could argue are maybe cognates, which is semantically drifted, and that's exactly what we did. But the difference is that because we made this up, we can then insert more vocabulary later on, which really does work. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not so good. Don't be as a real language. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much.